Hello, everyone. I know we're a little bit before noon, but just want to make sure the connection works and we are going. Thank you so much for being here if you're already in the in the waiting room. As we can see in the slide, uh, we are going to start soon, give a, a people a little bit of time to trickle in. But if you could comment on the stream in the chat, where are you tuning in from and what's your favorite floor tom mic? There is about an eight or 10 second delay. So I know it's not going to be like you're, you're going to be sitting here with me, but I would love to let you know below those two questions just so I can make sure everything is working. And again, here about three, four, uh, Five minutes we'll get going with the actual program just want to give some time for people to trickle in thank you so much for being here i'm excited about what's going on today so let me know below where are you tuning in from and what's your favorite floor tom microphone i wish i had some hold music to make this a little bit less awkward uh, as we're waiting on this delay uh, but today we're going to be talking about how to set up your console as a system processor traditionally there are two separate uh, devices. Um, I'm pretty excited about that. All right. So P Von B says from the Netherlands. Wow. It's a long ways away. What, what time is it there for you? That's a little bit different than a uh, central standard time in America, but you like the bear dynamic TG 58 C. I've never used that microphone. Very interesting. So from Santa Fe, New Mexico. So 57 on floor tone, very bold. Uh, you're from Irontown, Ohio, California, uh, the D6, the Audix D4, that's great. The D6 is one of, one of my favorite kick drum microphones. Um, so Belgium, I don't have a favorite floor time mic yet. You will, I promise. Uh, Ontario, Canada. I'm not familiar enough with floor time mics to have a favorite. No worries. Okay, so it's 7 p.m. Not too bad. And so 7 p.m. in the Netherlands. All right, very cool. Um, so my favorite floor time microphone is this, the Heil PR30. It's an American company, and you see it's well-loved. It's got scratches and dents. I got this 10 years ago. My first, I was into recording early on, and I had a, my, I took out a $2,000 loan from my grandma and bought a uh, eight-channel interface and a bunch of microphones and stands and started making records. It was a bl blast. I, I paid her back in less than six months, uh, which is a lot of fun, but it's a great all-around microphone. has a lot of great like attack and intensity. It's a very aggressive microphone and also has a lot of meat. I've also used it on snare as well. So that is my favorite floor tom microphone, the Heil PR30. There's also the PR40, which is equivalent to an RE20 from Electro Voice or something like that. That is mine. So anyway, folks are still trickling in. Just a couple more minutes and we will get rolling. So Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, so the uh, 57, if it's not rattling, that's funny. I'm sorry. I'm looking down. I have my, uh, chat down here. And then what I'm looking at over here. So Austin, Texas, welcome Austin. Uh, it's been a long time since it's been Austin, maybe about 12 years. Uh, so Trinidad and Tobago, the Audix D4. So we have two people with the Audix D4. Then we have the AKG P series, uh, the Philippines. It's one o'clock AM for you. Uh, let's see, Fateful on One. You are dedicated. Thank you so much for hanging out with me live. To be clear, these are all, all going to be recorded and posted on YouTube. So if you want to hang out with me live and ask questions and get interaction, that's awesome. But uh, I'll be adding chapter markers probably end of the week or early next week for other people to find it. And you'll have that. Okay, uh, I'm going to do, let's see. It is 12.03, we'll do 12.05 and we'll get rolling. So any others here, your favorite floor tom microphone. Man, one o'clock AM, you are very dedicated. So we got the Netherlands, Santa Fe, Ohio, Germany. So Justin B, thank you here from Germany. I see that. Austin, Texas, Trinidad and Tobago. We got a worldwide audience. This is pretty cool. Uh, I had a consulting call two days ago from someone in Nigeria. It's like, it's just cool. The internet is pretty awesome. So Indiana, the Sennheiser E604. That's a, I love how compact those are to be able to get under ride symbols. So those are, those are great uh, if you're running out of stands. The, the clips are nice. Um, so Mary Williams, you're right here in NWA. I don't know you. Well, you we need to hang out. So uh, I'm, I'm in Rogers right by the high school. So hopefully that's not too far from you. Pflugerville, Texas. Victor, good to meet you. I'm from I'm originally from Wiley, Texas, and I think our drum line competed against your drum line, so that that's pretty cool. Uh, but yes, Murray, yeah, definitely shoot me an email, message, whatever. We we can we can get together. I didn't know I, I had any other Arkansas folks up here. Uh, you're in Lowell. Well, fantastic. Yeah, that's like ten minutes from me. So bonjour from France. Uh, je m'appelle Michael Curtis. J'habite. 
Northwest Arkansas. That's all I remembered from my uh, college French class. So anyway, uh, it's probably a terrible accent. All right, so it's 12.04. So when it's 12.05, we will get cooking. Thank you so much for being here. Looks like we got around 33, I think right now is what you two tells me right in, here in the room. And so we'll be going over the agenda and workflow in just a second. But if you have not posted uh, your favorite floor, Tom, Mike, let me know. And uh, hey, it is one of my Nigerian friends. Thank you, Neofix. And then Brett Baker. Yes, this will be recorded. All three of my live streams are going to be recorded this week. Today in system processors, tomorrow on how big of a line array do you need? And then Thursday, how I screwed up a $200,000 sound system. So Anyway, they will all be recorded and posted on the channel. I'll probably send out like a, a recap email with all the recordings, but you can probably just come back to my channel page and get it right there. Um, and I'll answer this one last question and we'll get to it. So what equations do you use in your Excel sheet to find all those numbers you use for optimizing room acoustics? Ooh, uh, let's get to that one at the end because that was a little complicated. We're going to have to have time again for formal Q&A. Um, it looks like Michael Oshbachers from Wisconsin. All right, fantastic. Well, it's 12.05. We're going to get rolling here with our main segment. Um, I'll kind of lay out the agenda and our ground rules for what's going on, and I'll be checking in on the chat periodically. So let's rock and roll. So today we're covering how to set up your console as a system processor. So this is if you're at a gig that's like small or medium scale and there's not an external box that's taking care of it. I see you, hello from Kenya. Good, glad you're here. Um, so sometimes we have to have our console do it all. We're both mixing the show and managing all the speaker processing for our speakers there. So now you can see the agenda slide. So we're gonna go step-by-step step through the routing, how to use a matrices for setup and control. We're gonna go through the tuning workflow and we're gonna give some real world examples. We'll be walking through two different, one an install project and then one a live project of different sizes and complexities and scope. So at the very end, we'll have Q&A uh, but I'll periodically be checking in with you folks to see like, hey, is this making sense? And you let me know. And again, there's like an eight or 10 second delay. So sorry, that's awkward. Uh, but if we want to talk about anything else besides this core, just like general questions, like you said, from room acoustics, I'm happy to do that at the very end. I'm guessing this is going to take like 20 minutes to half an hour, just depending on how much we stop and have to clarify stuff. And as a reminder, I'm, I'm going live three times this week. Here's number one, tomorrow at noon central and Thursday at noon central. So please catch those. And, uh, and yes, for those who weren't here earlier, I'm leaving all three of these on YouTube. I'm not going to take it away. Um, so they'll be up there for folks. Cause I know again, for someone who's here, it's 1am for them in the morning. I forgot who it was, but they're committed. Um, so anyway, here we are. Uh, and so you probably saw, I emailed out my list. I, I also have my first course out making sense of sound. I'm really excited to share that with you. Um, the intro pricing is this week only. So it's still Friday at noon if you want to grab that. It's got a 60 day money back guarantee. Uh, the folks who have gone through it so far, my beta testers and those who've already bought it and gone through it, um, the, the biggest thing is they're really understanding phase at a deeper level. That's really uh, something that's been confusing for a lot of folks. So, so check it out. I've got two tiers, basic and advanced. Um, and this is inside the course, uh, all the videos walking through the decibel scale, velocity, amplitude, frequency, content, wavelength, fades, all this stuff. So that's what you get if you just get the basic tier. And on the advanced tier, uh, you get all of that plus three system tuning bonus training. So that's me putting a GoPro on my head, recording the system processor screen and smart and talking to three different sound systems as I tune in live. You get access to my private design file library, which is all the, two of the, these pro projects are included in here. You get access to all these files for system tuning and you get first dibs on future beta testing slots. So anyway, I'm excited to share that. Please check it out. Basically it gives you the foundation in audio to understand how sound actually works. And then you can build on that for system design. All right, that's all, that's the pitch. Um, and yes, the, Advanced pricing is also reduced this week. So yes, right now, basic is 97 and then advanced is 147 and they will likely go up by 50 bucks each just to give you a ballpark. Um, that's probably what's going to happen. And thank you, Brucius Venn from joining us from Las Vegas. Glad you are here. Uh, so yeah, so Friday at noon is when that stops uh, and they'll go up probably 50 bucks from, from then. And so make sure you get in on that. That's the course and we can answer any questions about the course after that. Okay, done with the pitch. Let's jump into the teaching from today. Uh, really excited to share this stuff with you guys. So what is a system processor and what does it do? All right, 
So this is a Meyer Galaxy, one of like the Rolls Royces of system processors. And this is the control software on the left. And what it does is it collects inputs uh, from a desk, a console, a microphone, whatever, and arranges them and routes them a certain way and processes them to make the system that it's going to sound its best. So, so the mounting, routing matrices get the right signals to the right place. They have level management for different speaker zones. So a line array might need a different level than a small little front fill speaker. And you can also use EQ for tonal shaping. Let's say you have mismatched speakers or even speakers from a different line in the same company, or you just want to shape the overall tonality of a system, a system processor is going to do that for you. And then the delays are for time syncing sources. So if you have a mains and then a delay or relay speaker, which we'll have today, you're going to need to tell the, the delay speaker to wait some for it to be synced up. So those are the main processing blocks that are in a system processor is routing, level management, EQ, and delays. All right. So why should your processing live externally instead of in your console? And thank you, Justin. Glad you, glad you got it. And hello from Ghana, Matur. So yeah, so why should it live um, externally instead of in your console? We have to keep it separated for these reasons. So if your show file disappears, your system isn't out of whack. I know some of you are freelance A1s where you're working with different companies and maybe get a Q1 here, QL1 here, a X32 here, a Ravage here, whatever. You're just having to load up your show file and go with what's happening. Some of you work in permanent venues like churches or theaters or whatever, and sometimes it's always on that desk. Either way, I like having it separate just in case your console dies, you're not up a creek because let's say you lose the file, you've done all your careful tuning and time alignment and level management in the console file. If someone wants to use it and messes it up, then you have to get someone in to come retune it or you have to retune it. So keeping it separated is really helpful. A system processor takes inputs from multiple desks and handles switching duties. So if you're at a festival and you have to take in multiple ones, you can do that on a production console at a festival, but I feel like it's easier in a system processor uh, and it's much smoother. So you're basically just dividing the duties of I'm a systems engineer right now and I'm a mix engineer by having a separate processor. And then a system processor ultimately has more customizable matrix routers and processing that's better suited to PA tuning, not mixing. Again, mixing consoles are great at mixing. System processors are great at making um, the, the PA sound great. So uh, Brucius asked, besides Meyer, what other system would you use it with? So one I'm using a lot is the Allen & Heath AHM64. We're actually going to use that in the demo. I think it's like a fantastic, uh, like a huge amount of value, especially for the price. And they have three tiers, the AHM16, the AHM32, and the AHM64 with varying amounts of processing and I.O. Uh, I just did an install with the AHM64. I'm probably going to order an AHM32 for myself. And we, uh, we can go over that in detail at the very end. But I feel like for the price point, the AHM32, I think is like 1300 uh, 1400, something like that. It's a great unit. Uh, you can also go with the classic like DBX drive rack stuff that's like way old, but it's meant more for like speaker crossovers and not really aligning a system for various reasons. But yeah, the Galaxy is super expensive, but there's also the Prodigy. Anyway, we can cover that a little bit later. So here's the AHM64 demo for an install I did at Emmanuel Baptist Church, Little Rock. I also did a video on how to check your speakers before you put them in a line array, and this was this video. So here's the rig, at least the front rig. We have up here, up here is a flown KLA 12 rig. So this is a single 12 inch woofer with a compression driver and it's a constant curvature array box. So it's 18 degrees by 100 degrees or 18 by 90, I think it is. And so we have five 18 degree boxes in the array and then a single 18 inch sub, the KW or the KLA 181, which is the same thing as the KW 181, but has a rigging hardware. And that's what we have. So we have a sub output on top and then five speakers and then a single sub up here and then five KLAs. And they basically purchased this as an interim rig before they're getting a true line array solution. We actually ended up doing away with these front fills, but they had those with the previous rig because their line array was dying and they just need to get something in there for it to be intelligible. So let's look at now the system processor file I had. So again, this is with the Allen & Heath AHM 64. So it has a bunch of zones and processing and features, but we're just gonna walk through at its core, the core um, features of it that would apply to any other system processor. 
So let's start from ins and work our way to outs. So here on the left, I have three inputs. I call it mix left, mix right, and then sub mono. We decided to have from the desk a pair of matrices that just basically got the left right bus passed directly to it at unity and then passed out and that's right here for mix left and right and then sub mono they wanted a separate sub matrix to be in front of this just in case they had like a youth event and they really wanted to bump the subs and so those are my three inputs and then i'm able to pass those on to what are called zones in allen and heath language so let's look at those specific zones and again, I'm just kind of giving you the overall framework for what a system processor is doing. And then we will lay that over on top of how we need to transfer those concepts to a console. So I promise we'll get there. So I started with zone three PA left. So that then collects um, the mix left input as we can see right here. So this approach, I'm borrowing from Michael Lawrence. I got it from his book and also just from talking with him. It's a kind of a three-tiered approach. You have your inputs, you have a zone or a, just like a processing container for the individual set of speakers. So in this case, the five hangs of KLA 12 all together, and then have individual outputs for each box in that array. So I can go back to inputs and if an artist is plugging into my system processor and they, hey, I want a little bit more low end overall, I'm not having to go here and go down to my subs and, and bring them up. I just use a low end shelf, bump it up overall, or I can, uh, this sub mono input, boost it up in this particular information, in particular situation. So I have the stereo inputs. Uh, so PA left is now getting mix left, and then PA left is now sent to each of these five zones, PA left A, B, C, D, E, which are these five boxes. And that way it can cas cascade processing. I want to move as much, oh, sorry, I'll go back to my PIP. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, we go back to PA left, and I would cascade all of my processing here. So mix left doesn't have any processing, then PA left, which gets mix left for that particular KLA, this was the EQ that I did on the KLA 12 itself. I know it feels aggressive, but the boxes had a lot of low end buildup and that room was super reverberant. So I ended up taking up a lot of low end. Then this signal is then passed on to PA left A. And then for that specific box, this was the EQ. And I took out a bunch of top end because it was tilted pretty well up and I didn't want the extra top end spilling around. And then PA left B then had this little bit of EQ and then was fed out to each speaker. Um, but all along the way, I'm able to, on each specific zone, do the particular EQ and level moves that I wanted to make. All right, I'm going to stop here and look at the chat. Hi, Michael. Assume you just did your smart measurements. So you know by how much subs should be delayed. You do it by changing output delay in the console or start tweaking system processor delay. If it's like a system thing, we're going to move that downstream to the console. I don't want my mix engineer worrying about sub delay. So if I can move that to the processor, I will. And then, uh, yeah, Mr. Lawrence is great. Learned a lot from his posts on Reddit and Pro Sound Web. Definitely join him on the Signal to Noise podcast Discord server. So check that out. It's free. I'm in there well, as well answering questions. But uh, are there any questions about this approach so far as far as the kind of cascading of input to a zone that takes care of an array of speakers or a set of speakers and then the each individual outputs. They kind of cascade in that order. Um, so let me know if that's making sense. And uh, if so, we'll keep moving forward and then we can apply some of this uh, to routing within our consoles. Again, apologize for the awkward delay, but I'm gonna go ahead and move that way. And if I see any questions, we can always come back here. Uh, but the, I'll, I will say, here's a screenshot of my smart data after the tuning. This is my target trace. I've also stolen from Michael Lawrence, the white line you see here. And then these are these four mic positions at the third row, uh, on the floor of the third row, the balconies, and then the back floor all along the way. And so I feel like it, it went pretty well. We will get the system tonality where we wanted it. I did think I ended up adding a low pass filter on the very top here. Um, so a question, do you get to increase individual levels where necessary? So this depends. So where necessary, I would say I'm not on a, a constant curvature array, even a line array. Gain shading, like the overall level is where I go to last. So I 
would try to use high-end EQ first and wise because those boxes aren't coupled in the top end. The waveguides are able to keep uh, the high frequency separate from the other. But if I start tapering down level throughout the array, I may get the level variance on the floor a little bit better, but we're gonna start to get low frequency lobing, which is a little bit of a sneak peek uh, for something we're gonna talk about a little bit later. Uh, but yeah, so I usually on a per box basis, I'm using top end EQ. I'm usually not touching anything below 1K on an individual box. Anything below 1K, I'm touching across the entire array of boxes, which is why I like having this tiered processing approach. So um, are you calling the zones in the boxes, are, are you calling zones the boxes in the array? So sorry, I, I might've been conflating the logic a little bit. So it's inputs are routed to a zone and that's Alan Heath language. Um, and you can also put a zone to a zone. So I'm taking this PA left zone, then routing it to each of these five other zones. So I would say input, this is a particular array of speakers that I want to process as a group, and this is an individual speaker in the array. So sorry, I probably wasn't that clear on my terminology. Wonderful. So, and so yeah, later on in the Q and A, we can talk more about the tuning and approach. I plan on making a video on that in the future, but at least want to get the routing scheme uh, going there for, and I can also use, if I wanted to, the PA left, just turn down the fader right here. So I can control that and control those mutes. Joss Wertheimer, sorry I may have missed this, but are those FIR filters on the individual box EQs? They are not. They're just run-of-the-mill IRR EQs, but still not minimal phase shift on top end because I'm not, they're broad shelves and I'm not doing that much. So I'm not really worried because high frequencies aren't coupling much in the array anyway, since they're constant curvature. And even if it was a line array, uh, I'm not worried about the little bit of phase shift that we're gonna get. Again, the most aggressive EQ that we're seeing here is across the entire PA left. And to be clear, I did on the KLA 12, they have like an array configuration, a uh, little preset guy. And I did have that on array five because there were five boxes in the array. And I also had the external sub switch on that. So with an active system, you have the choice of having your system processor do all of the, the LF management and, or, you know, whatever, uh, every manufacturer has a different word for it, but the array processing or, uh, Array size management, sorry, that's usually what it is. Uh, but I kind of did a hybrid approach here. Okay, I think I don't see any more questions. So let's see if we can jump back in here. So now that you've seen what a system processor looks like, let's see if we can apply some of these rules over to what's gonna look like in a console. So if you do not have a system processor. So I have four rules for routing and then EQ and delay, that's that's the same across them. So, hi, Michael. <laughs> Looks like Michael Lawrence is here. He's, he's crashing the party. I uh, already talked about your uh, your three-tiered approach here. So uh, so you can you know fact check me if I get anything wrong. Okay, so four rules I have is that every channel and or subgroup goes to the left right bus, but the left right bus never leaves the console by itself. So we again that the your master bus, your master bus, your two mix, your two bus, whatever you call it, I'm just gonna call it the left right. That bus never leaves naked. It's always gonna pass through a matrix first, and that's gonna serve as our downstream zone, if you will, or container to dish out to different speakers. So matrices are what feed each speaker zone. Again, we'll jump to, through two different examples. I'm gonna walk through M32 edit and how I set it up. So that's to come. Uh, get back here to Chrome. Woo. Here we go, sorry. Uh, so matrices are what we're gonna use as the containers that feed each speaker zone. And so the left right is sent post fader at Unity to stereo destinations. So if we had a stereo rig, you know, a left, right, I would send it at Unity. And then the left, right is sent at negative six dB to mono destinations because we're gonna have mostly correlated stuff in our mix, um, unless you go on immersive and doing all the crazy stuff. But um, we want it to, the gain structure to come out equal. So if we add two exactly correlated signals together, um, we are gonna get plus six dB. So to keep our gain structure constant, we're gonna, the send value from the left, right to the matrix is gonna be at negative six. Again, we'll walk through all this. Uh, so the left, right fader stays at unity for mix time 
all the system shading or relative balances are done at the matrix faders. And then if you do need to adjust the overall system volume at the desk or maybe duck something rather quickly or mute whatever, you have one place where you can adjust the entire rig at the left right fader. So those are the rules. So we're gonna take a look at a install I did down at a church in Fort Worth. Uh, they did have a system processor, but I'm gonna pretend we all had to do their system processing on a M32. So here is their rig. They have a single K12 main, a single K12 delay. These are active speakers if you're unfamiliar with them, so no amps involved. They're, well, the amps are built into the speakers. We have two CP8s for front fills, and we have a single center ground stack sub. That's something they already installed in the stage, and I didn't want to yank it out. Um, they did just have a left-right rig, and I basically broke out the K12s and put them as delays. So here's the Ease Focus 3 file that I ended up using, um, and just shows you the, the division of labor. So I have this K12 main covering the front half of the room, this K12 covering the back half. Here are the CP8s right here covering this little front zone. And what I don't have on here is the center sub, but that's what's going on. And uh, thank you for sharing Thomas. It's hi from Slovenia. The ferret floor tom mic is the Lewitt MPT3340. Hmm, awesome. Yeah, that was kind of like that. Where are, you, where are you coming in from and what's your favorite floor tom mic? So that was our opener. So feel free to share that. So that's kind of the division of labor. So I have five speakers total. All right, so let's build this thing. Let's hop into M32 edit and go. So I made a little custom layer here on user two, and these are the main ones we're gonna be looking at. Again, all of these concepts apply to other desks. Uh, we're just, this is just one that a lot of us I think are familiar with. So here's my left, right fader. So if I turned out my kick drum on channel one, it's gonna be by default going to my left, right mix. And I have its, you know, master fader, if you will. Let's go ahead and put that in unity. Now, we need to route that to each of our destinations. So what are our destinations? We have K12 main, K12 relay, and it's a relay, not a delay because it's taking over coverage. It's not a coherence amplifier, if you will. Then we have CPA front fill, and we're gonna put that on a single matrix because I don't ever really feel like we need to control those independently. We can daisy chain, the room is symmetrical, so I'm fine with that. Then we have our sub. I forget the model number they had in there. It might've been the KS112 or the 212. Anyway, so those are our four matrix destinations. So that's what's gonna be passed out of the console to each speaker. So now let's go to routing. We have to fill those containers with something, right? So we're gonna go here up to sends, and this is a mono destination, it's a stereo mix. So we're gonna send it at negative six. And then this is a mono destination. Here we're gonna sum it down, sum it down, and sum it down, just so we can keep our gain structure kosher. And so these are all sent at negative six. Any questions so far, put them in the chat. I'll stop and clarify things, but uh, we're gonna keep moving and grooving. So the now let's continue our processing and see how we would get them out of the desk and look at that. And then we'll go back to how we might apply EQ across the system if we needed to shape tonality. <clears throat> so we go over here to our routing tab and this is our outputs one through 16. So if you're unfamiliar with the workflow in X32 world or M32, we have these things called outputs that kind of serve as little containers that you can pass out of a physical um, output. So Matthew asks, can you clarify relay versus delay speakers? So yes, so a relay speaker, if we go back to our drawing here, this is a relay situation. So you can see by the colors I made on, on this graph, this K12 is covering basically from here to here. And it's saying, hi, this is my zone. It's almost like you're walking around Dillard's or something. It's a 70 volt speaker. If you're standing under it, you know, shopping for another polo or a, well, like one of the five shirts I wear, um, you're gonna be in that specific zone. And then as I walk over to here to blue, this now speaker is firmly in charge of what's going on. I'm truly subdividing and, co and conquering. So in a relay race, you're handing off the baton to the next person in the race and you stop running. So a delay speaker may mean, let's say we had a bigger main system over here, a line array, and I had it to where it would go all the way to the back but the room acoustics in here stink. So even if I could get low variance all the way to the back, 
I might add a supplemental delay speaker a little bit farther back just to have some restored top end clarity at the back. So the main system is still responsible for the whole thing, but they just have some friends that are close to the listener to help restore coherence or intelligibility. So that would be a delay speaker. Um, so great, so thanks for waiting here, Michael. I like, I like to think about each source having custody of a certain area. Great, um, and thank you Relentless for subbing and thanks for being here. Okay, hope that was clear, uh, helpful for you, Matthew. We can talk more about that later at the end if it's still confusing. Uh, I'm sorry, when, when I go live, I'd start to talk too fast. So I, I promise I'll, I'll slow down here. So coming back to our desk, we have our left right feed, its faders at Unity, its send value to each matrix um, is now at negative six since it's a mono destination. And now we need to get this, these suckers out of the console. So going over to our routing tab, I'm going to have matrix one, go to output one, two, three, four, all right? And that is how we have them uh, laid out. The only tri tricky part is the CP8 front fill, we have two of those speakers and we can either duplicate outputs or we can daisy chain out the speakers since they have a pass-through. A little trick here in the CP8s, uh, the attenuator on the back, uh, it's not a straight uh, passive pass-through, if you will. It does hit that attenuator so if you want to set levels on the speaker, keep them at noon so that way your pass-through doesn't get hit by the gain. I had a different gig where I had four CP8s all daisy chained together for front fills. I, I brought it down to nine o'clock instead of noon and on every speaker so that my, my level dropped by 25% at every speaker. So that wasn't cool. Um, all right, so then we're going to go back to our XLR outs and we now have these as passing out outputs one through eight and that's going there. So let's assume that we're just gonna daisy chain the CP8s and keep it um, their knobs at Unity. Here's a question. Is there any difference in sending signal to sub matrix from left, right, or from dedicated mono bus? Yes, there is, because unless you're mixing the left, right, uh, exactly like the mono bus of everything being sent to the mono bus, like every source is being sent to the mono bus and all of it is post fader, that's a duplicate mostly of the left, right bus, uh, but, for instance, some people want to send just bass to the subs or just kick drum, which I, uh, that's not my purview, where I guess uh, I don't like ox fed subs or mixing on the mono because I just have, to, I like to worry about one mix <laughs> the whole time. And there's some other system engineering stuff we can get to a little bit later. But yes, there is a difference. I want to send my left, right mix to the sub, and that's just the container that I end up sending to the sub. And I'll worry about divvying up crossovers and frequency management in the processor. So I'm not having to mix and worry about, do I want more of the monobus or the subs, or do I need to EQ the kick drum higher? So you're just making more decisions on the fly while you're mixing if you're doing aux fed subs or a monobus versus just trusting your system alignment, then making EQ choices on the individual sources. So we're passing those out. And then now on the X32, outputs one, two, three, four, our K12 main, delay, front fills, and sub. Now I can apply individual delays on those matrix outputs. So just like our Allen and Heath, we can do that as well. Uh, the AHM64 we referenced earlier. And then this is also where we manage levels. So let's say I want the K12 main to be at Unity. And on this design, I actually ended up shading down the delay speaker to dB. So I would go here to my K12 relay, and that's where I'm gonna manage levels. The CP8 front fills, those were really close to the audience. And in Ease Focus 3 to get the, the coverage I wanted, I ended up shading those down 10 dB and I left the sub at Unity. All right, so that's setting levels. We showed where we can set the delays. So I think also I needed to delay the K12 relay speaker by, I think it was 26 milliseconds. And that, that's what it was. So I'd put that in there. And if I wanted to do main to sub alignment, uh, I would apply the delay on the sub because it's on the floor because the, the, the flown main is higher. If I also wanted to delay my uh, front fill speakers to my mains, I would apply that here. I think it was about 11 milliseconds if I'm remembering it correctly. <clears throat> but all that being said, I've set my relative levels of the whole thing after making sure my send values to each zone were all right. And then now it would be time to EQ the rig. So if I wanted to apply any processing, so let's say in the K12 main, it has a, a switch on the back for me to add a high pass filter so it can have its own dedicated crossover sent to the sub. I can activate that, 
or I could go to the EQ and have my, it was a Butterworth 12 dB per octave at 98 Hertz is what's gonna be the closest thing that the K12 can do. I would also do the same thing on the K12 relay. Hit EQ, 98 Hertz, and then same thing on the CP8 front fills. Go here, 98 Hertz. And there we are. And the sub already has high pass and low pass, for, low pass filters built into its processing. So I usually don't end up touching that, at least in not, not in this uh, situation. So that's the processing. And then I would start tuning place microphones in any specific zone that needed EQ. This is where I would apply it and get it all to my target curve, which I showed you earlier. This is Michael Lawrence's curve that I use. Uh, and these are the traces I got from that earlier system I referenced, the K, K, uh, KLA-12 rig. So I would EQ on the main speakers, set my levels. Um, and then now, if I'm mixing this rig now, after I can already trust the target curve and alignment, I know what it's like. If I wanted to apply anything on my mix, I would backtrack and do that across the left-right bus. That way, any choices I make translate to the entire rig, since every matrix is downstream of the left-right. So that's another reason why I don't like having the separate mono bus, is like if I want a little bit more low end of my mix, um, and I want it to extend beyond the cutoff frequency of the sub fader or the subs, then I'll have to go to two different places. I have to EQ my left, right and EQ the mono or EQ that matrix and EQ the other one. So I like consolidating those decisions. So Derek asks, what would dictate the type of crossover filter you would use? So Butterworth, Liquids Riley, 1224. So that depends on the speaker's response. Um, and and so this actually, me coming to find this is the same thing, was just by taking a K12, putting it on the ground, putting a microphone six feet in front of it, and just measuring uh, what was going on. And then I tried to see if I can duplicate the phase response and the magnitude response by playing filters myself with it turned off. Alternatively, you can go to someplace like tracebook.org, where a lot of third-party measurements have been taken. I've uploaded stuff here. And so look, here's a KS-118 that Nathan Lively did. You can go here, download this trace, put it in smart, look at it, uh, and then download a different speaker. And I think some folks have even, uh, let's look at a K12, see if we can find it. So here's a K12 and it looks like the processing preset was normal. So this is without the processor. So I could download this. Um, I think there's also another one on here with it on. So, um, I would just try to get the phase responses to be as close to the original processing as it could. Uh, that would marry well with the sub I have it paired with. So that's that process there. Okay, back to the processor. Um, I think that covers it for this example. We're gonna move on to another one that's a little bit more complicated unless anyone has any questions and hopefully me moving through that will make these concepts sit a little bit better. Just a... Uh, Speak now before I initialize the, the console. Cool, thanks Mark for the encouragement. I'll go ahead and, and save this just in case we need to go back to it. Let's just do grace. Okay, saw so you use the shelving EQ first on Attaway's video. Should that be a first option? Hey Nathan, yes, Trace book, shout out. Um, so yes, I did. So a shelving EQ is what I start with because it's the most gentle and usually gets me where I want to go the quickest. So if you start using all these tiny little parametrics, you're, you're missing the force for the trees. So as you can probably see right here, this spike at 2K, I wasn't really happy with in the third row. But if I started doing something um, on it, it started affecting this orange trace too much because those boxes did have some overlap at that frequency. So starting too tiny, uh, you start taking too many, making too many decisions too soon. So shelving filters is able to knock in the whole response of the whole rig a little bit gentler, and then I go back and get any gremlins if I need to. Um, so yeah, so that, I start with that first. And then Matthew asks, what would di dictate the type of crossover filter? So I would say what would dictate that uh, is basically the needs of the speaker. So if we... Uh, Last time I tried to launch Smart while I live streaming, my, my computer about took off and <laughs> cooked itself. So uh, I wish I could show you some more, more traces, but 
what it comes down to is that the, the phase response of the speaker is going to be altered no matter what filter you put on it and left it unless it is FIR. And that's usually within a very specific processor from the manufacturer. So I would look at capture the response of the speaker solo with it just naked, no processing, look at the magnitude and phase response and then capture it with the sub. And again, you can go to Tracebook and they have an entire like way, um, even if you don't care about mains to sub alignment, just a way to accurately capture speakers in the near field. So just, you can just, it's really good instructions on how to get good data from speakers. So all that being said, you you would have to look at how the, how the amount of overlap between the speakers. So if there's a lot of overlap, pay attention because when things are equal in level, you can have the most amount of either constructive or destructive interference. And then looking at the face slopes, the way they interact with each other, uh, if they're more than 50 degrees of part, that's a problem because you're getting f five dBs of summation if they're within 50 degrees, but I'll look at whatever slope is early or later. So it's going to be steeper. Uh, you have to get the other one to match it. So I, I get, there's probably still some holes in that, but you just have to play around with it, the different types of filter to see if you get the phase slopes to match between mains and sub or mains and whatever other speaker you're trying to get it to match. So P von B, what is the best order in processing? Gain per zone, EQ per zone, timeline? Oh, that's a fantastic uh, question. So the order of operations is after I make sure the placement of my speaker is right and that I've verified all speakers are working and I can trust that their gains they would say they are is level setting first. So I level set the entire zones. So if this is a line array, all boxes are at unity, to, to start with, I'm setting that macro level box for the rig. I usually start with the loudest one with the most amount of coverage first, and then I fold other things in. So in this rig, I would do the mains K12, and then go to the delay speaker and level set it. And yes, I know there's a timing offset. Uh, and then I would go to the CP8 front fills, and then I would move in low frequencies next. So I would just kind of walk the room, play some music, kind of have to deal with the flaming for a little bit, or I would just place it in the middle of its zone with a measurement microphone and level set it to there, just depending how savvy you are with measurement gear or whatever. I would set level set first, and then I would do EQ per zone, because EQ is going to change... Um, the high frequency content, which is going to go into our impulse response, which is what our delay finders latch onto. So that's going to change timing. So then EQ, it's also going to change phase response. So we don't want to, we want to time align after our phase response is set. So all that being said, I would do level setting, then EQ per zone, walk and make sure tonality feels good. And then I would do time alignment because we need to align sources that have different propagation times at where they're equal in level. So for this rig, this ended up being right here. So when this front speaker and this relay speaker were equal in level was there, but I can't determine if they're equal in level until they're already level set for their zones. And then I would go back, apply any kind of master, if you will, EQ across the whole rig. So hopefully that answers your question, P von B. Okay. So if that's all making sense with this rig, now we're going to jump to our next scenario. I have a video on this that does this basically very quickly, but I wanted to slow down here and take questions on it. And this is how I tune an arena PA with just six PA uh, matrix outputs. So this is the University of Arkansas commencements. I'm actually doing them again this December. And I try to do something a little bit different every time just to see if I can get away with it. Um, so he said, this production in East Focus 3 looks like the club that I'm working. Well, maybe you can steal it. I, I can give you the link if you want it. That's fine. So the University of Commencement, so it's a left and right RCF HDL6A main. So we have 12 boxes per side. Again, we don't, on this gig, we don't have external processors. So it's going to be a single drive line to all 12. So I better get the design right. <laughs> I have a K12 center fill that's hung off a little truss. We'll see a picture in a minute. And then I have a left, right inverting gradient stack subs. I couldn't put subs in the middle. I couldn't experiment with a sub arc or anything like that. So it's just left, right, and they're coupled with the main arrays. Then I have four CP8 front fills on stage, two K12 front fills stacked on subs. And then I also have to get out a feed to Bud Walton Arena's PA, which is right here. So um, let me go through this and I'll get to your question, uh, Moator. So the house PA are these six EAW hangs and they have a center sub uh, uh, dual array thing. So that's the house and all the yellow is mean. So here is the HDL, um, sorry, HDL six A's. And then I have the flown center K12. 
I have subs and a little stack uh, front fill here. I have four CP8 front fills across the front. And then here's my other subs. That kind of gives you an idea of the layout. So it's a lot of different destinations. They also have to use a tie line on the back. Here's where front of house is. And then there's a wall, there's an XLR drive line that gets me all the way up to the booth right here, which has a VI-1. I think a Soundcraft is what it has that feeds a lake processor that then sends it all over to here. <laughs> so it's kind of convoluted, but anyway, so that is the rig. So let, now let's jump into here and recreate what my console would be like and the things I need to keep track of there. So I'm going to initialize the desk. Uh, is that set up? Yep. Set up. Initialize mixer. Boom. So I have RCF left, RCF right, the two left and right 12 box hangs. And the reason I do that is because on this gig, you see this choir riser? <laughs> That's right under this PA and <laughs> we can't move it. I don't have skinny boxes on the, bo on the bottom or anything, uh, but I actually end up panning some of the choir mics more over to this array so I don't have to deal with feedback as much. So that's why I keep it as stereo matrix. Look at the questions here. Uh, so your approach, you're reducing the level on the matrices. I reduce, I keep, if it's an active system, I keep the boxes at unity to start or just at zero position. And then I use matrices to decrease them if it's too hot for a specific zone. If I'm at the amps, I have the amps dimed or at their unity position and then just feed them less level if they need it. Uh, and then Mez says, assume you're finished engineering the system and handle it to the mix engineer. He or she starts cutting nasty dips and crossover range on main matrices as they're going to mess with phase alignment. All for naught. Uh, they're probably cutting it not because you misaligned things if you've done your work. They're probably cutting it because that room has too much of reverberation time at 125 hertz, which we can't do anything about. <laughs> That's the one of the most critical ranges of getting the room reverb right for like a rock or a pop mix to really feel good. So it's probably just too much ringing around. Um, and so if they keep like ducking some of that and you've trusted that you got the system to that target trace all across your audience, that's either their mix isn't translating or they're just hearing too much of a long decay of that frequency or you very well could have screwed stuff up. So I would just, you know, check yourself, practice, really go through all this, but I've never seen a mismatch mains to sub-alignment, like ruin a show. That, that's not the case. So I, I would stop stressing so much about getting that right. I think first you need to do level setting, verify all your boxes. It could be you just, you know, hung your line array, but you didn't check the polarity of each driver first. And you're just hearing funny stuff of like the eighth box in your array is out, you know, out of polarity uh, or is has a polarity reverse compared to the rest of the array. So I think there's lots of other gotcha moments besides, oh, I didn't mismatch my main or match my mains and sub. Again, please get to it if you have the time, but I've never seen it ruin a show. So that's my input there. Okay, jumping back to our M32 edit here. RCF, RCF left and right. I'm going to go config. I am going to link those just in case in this specific show, I wanted to pan something right so it doesn't spill into the um, the choir riser. And then my matrix that's feeding the Bud Walton PA is ultimately a mono sum. So it's not going to be affected by that panning decision. And then I have my center fill, just label it center. Then I have front fill and then I have sub. All right, so I have these and I'm gonna send them now at Unity to this stereo destination because it's a stereo feed to a stereo destination. Center fill is minus six, front fill is minus six, sub is minus six. Those are all mono destinations and for that one, I'm just gonna do BWA for Bud Walton Arena and that is gonna be minus six. So those are my six matrices that now I can send to those unique destinations. Again, I have 12 boxes in the air. It's just gonna hit the box and daisy chain all the way down, a single feed to the center fill. And now I'm gonna have a single front fill drive line that's actually gonna go from the stage rack back here, hit this front fill and go boom, 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 boom. And the nice thing about having active boxes is that I can do some local EQ attenuation on these K12s if I need to. So that's kind of extending my system processing. And I feel comfortable having them on the same output because they are on the same plane in relation to the audience. Um, and I can add processing at this individual speaker or this individual speaker if I need to. So that's the kind of decisions you have to make. It's like I have some processing downstream of me, I have some upstream of me. Anyway, that's kind of what's going on there. 
So now let's manage levels. I would start with my mains at Unity. I ended up shading my center fill 10 dB, front fills by 12 dB, subs I left at Unity, and Bob Walton Arena I keep at Unity just so I can remember that if I'm sending that to the arena, it's gonna be happy. I put my left right fader at Unity and thus begins the routing and then tuning process. Let's go back to routing, go here, and I'm gonna turn all these off. We go matrix one and two is left, right. There's only feeds in need of that. One center fill output and the front fills is just one output. Uh, and then I actually have two outputs for subs. And so since I wanna keep it all odd, even pairs, I'll have output five for matrix six and then sub and sub. So I could send it to the left set and then the right set. These were KS118s from QSC. They had built-in delay and level processing. So I actually did the delay, put them in cardioid mode, put one on top of the other, face the other backwards. And this was like their native stacked or inverted gradient sub setup. So I moved that processing downstream of me. I could have had two separate outputs and then done the output delay um, and polarity inversion right here. So that's the output delay I would need for the rear facing sub. And then the actual output itself, uh, I could go here and it says phase right here, which I don't know why they're doing that, but then sub right here, that's where I would invert polarity if I needed to do that. This particular production company, all of their HDL 6As that got shipped to them uh, had the, the pins reverse, the hot and cold <laughs> reverse. So I have to, I later found I need to invert the polarity on that output to get those mains to play nice. So anyway, so that's kind of the routing scheme, how I get it out of there. And then from then on out, the RCFs, again, to get it to play nice with the KS-118s, um, KS, yeah, 118s, I applied a high pass or a Butterworth 12, the 12 dB per octave at 98 Hertz. Same thing with the center fill. That's what worked best. And front fills, same thing. So that's what I'm applying first is high pass filters to take care of LF management, get the phase responses to where they're going to be with the system. The subs already had low pass filters and got them to a specific phase place, so, or um, phase response. And Bud Walton Arena, I left wide open. Then I had to go to their desk and manage my input going to their subs and then their mains feed. So that's kind of the, the entire um, setting. And so then I went and started tuning. I would start with my main array first, the HDL 6As. And so I have in another, um, shoot, I forgot to include this slide, I'm sorry. So I have, what was it? Delay speakers, I apologize here. I'll include it later, but anyway, I placed a microphone on over on this. I said, here's my, uh, a microphone, B, C, D. And I place them at those points in the audience and I capture my traces there. And that was for the main system. I'll apply EQ across the whole array. Remember, I don't have per box processing. Um, and then I then moved down to my center fill, down to my front fills, folded in the subs, and then saw how the entire arena PA worked into there. All right, so Mez is asking a question. How do you verify the display angle of the array? So I was able to uh, take my inclinometer uh, with my little tool, uh, sorry, the sight angle. Uh, yeah, so the, the sight angle, the entire array. So I built in Ease Focus 3. Uh, and, and again, I don't wanna push my computer <laughs> too hard to open up parallels right now with it streaming. Uh, but the design, uh, I think it had at negative 13.2 degrees. And once I hung the array and just had the rig floating, I have a little square inclinometer and I placed that on the fly bar, which is uh, the zero point of the array. And it told me negative 11.2. So I had a little bit of an up tilt. So I actually had to change my rigging point. No, the original was 11.2 and it was down at negative 13. So I actually had to, to raise it a little bit or it was one of those two. Anyway, I just basically place an inclinometer while the rig is floating and then both motors mo move up. I understand that not all motor chains move equally and the center of gravity uh, may change. Um, and so if I was able to get a laser measurement up to the actual, like make sure the truss was equal, that would have been better, but I was just able to verify it on the ground. I didn't have any fancy inclinometers 
uh, that's that I could keep on the array. I could just test it on the, while I was floating there. All right, so that is the that is the setup. <laughs> so that's that's the file, the basic routing scheme, and then if I needed to apply any EQ overall to the array for my mix, I would do it here. But I'm applying it on the EQ for each zone as I'm needing to get it to my desired target curve, which I'm shooting for right here. All right, so now I'm going to open it up for Q and A. Uh, any more beyond this, and we could talk about what's included here, what's coming in the next live streams, anything about my course, feel free to ask, and we'll hang out here for a little bit, and I will sign off. So it is now open for any questions. Cue hold music. All right, give it a little bit more time here. Just so you can see, this is on Tracebook, the HDL6A measurement, and this is without any processing on it. If you wanted to pull that, so I definitely pulled this. I had one in the field that I measured. So Derek asks, if you were to forget your measurement interface, how would you, with it just X32? Great question. Did you, uh, sub placement, this was great. Do you get to do per box processing when you have that available? Okay, great. Um, I and my limiter on the matrices. All great questions. Okay, uh, I'm going to get to the X32, M32 routing one last. Stand by. Okay. So let's do limiter after the matrices. No, I do not. Because if I'm having to do internal processing on the desk, that means my inserts or processing uh, is also very limited. <laughs> and so I'm using the precision limiter on the X32 for my broadcast feed to get levels and all that. So I don't have to waste that. And that also adds additional latency at the desk. So if I'm using only have enough limiters for my mains and not my front fills or something like that, um, it, it just adds unnecessary complexity, eats up processing. And the K12s, the HDL 6As, they all have built-in limiting in them. So I don't need to do it myself and have to worry about it. So an active speaker or even like a system that has integrated amps and DSP, I'm not worrying about it. Um, let's see. I'll get to the X32 one. Uh, did I talk about subplacement? I did not. So they were right here. So I have... They, it was just two KS-118s, one facing forward, one facing back. And the reason why I placed them right there is I couldn't put them in front of the stage. There was not enough uh, of a walkway or, or space. I couldn't put them under the stage. I usually don't like doing that anyway. And so I chose to keep them coupled with the main array so they can kind of move on that plane together. And that's where I put them. Um, I've done a three element uh uh, I guess in, I always get this mixed up. Inverted gradient, where I had three in a row with one facing backwards. Uh, but this is the first show I had the KS-118s with it before the KW-181s. And so I wanted to try out its cardioid processing and see if it worked. So that's why I did the, the stack. So do you get to... Oh, can't see. Sorry. So sorry. I'm back here. I knew I shouldn't have switched it. So I'll, I'll redo that real quick. So here's the sub. One's facing forward. One's facing back. Uh, and I chose to get them coupled here with the flown arrays. I could not put them in front of the stage. Sorry about that. Um, I'll keep it on here. Thanks for letting me know, Jeff. And, and, so, and sorry, that was unclear. And let me know if I didn't answer anything you were asking for. Ideally, I'd fly subs with them, but this show, it's like, it's a commencement. Uh, it's not the additional budget needed to get more motors and have flyable subs and all that wasn't worth it for this specific show. So that's why we didn't do it. Uh, so do you get to do per box processing when you have that available? Yes, I would love to do per box processing. And what the things I'm changing on a per box basis are uh, usually a high shelf and the high frequencies to get the tonal balance front to back better. That's that's what I'm, what I'm doing there. I'm shooting for a plus or minus 3 dB variance front to back. And if I can do that by using individual box uh, high frequency shading, I'm never adjusting the entire gain of the box, uh, almost never. It's, it's a last 
resort if I really need to, so things are being really wonky, but on a per box basis. Another per box processing is if I'm using some type of low mid beam steering technology. So with Meyer, that's low mid beam control. There's array processing with DMB, which most of the time I don't end up using, but that you need on a two box or one box per output. So if I have it my way, at least two boxes per output, uh, optimally it's one box per output. So uh, thanks, Jeff, for letting me know that we couldn't see earlier. Mez, does EQ decisions could affect timing relationships between mains and fill systems? Yes, they technically could. Um, and that's, I would say, if you can save your timing for the very end or at least recheck it after you do EQ on a per basis, they absolutely can. And that's usually only if you're doing like really severe EQ. Again, if it's a gentle high shelf on your front fills, uh, to bring the top end down since they're close to people, that's not a big deal. And same thing with the per box shading on the line array. So yeah, definitely recheck it if you've done some EQ after your alignment, but it's it's usually not a big change at all. All right, so we talked about sub placement, per box processing, uh, relationships between mains and fill systems, limiters. Okay, so we'll get to the X32 routing question and feel free to ask more questions, folks. I'm here as long as y'all want to be. So if I forgot my measurement interface, how would you do it? Let me see if I can attempt to recreate it. I would go to an input, usually a, my last set of inputs so I can save it. So let's go to input 31, plug in my measurement microphone there. And I'll turn on phantom power, use the gain. I would definitely not send it to my main, so I'd <laughs> unroute it here. Um, and I would then go to my routing tab and use my card output. And I could pass out a local input there. So if that was input 31, uh, I would then plug in my computer over USB to the X32, or if it has a Dante card, use Dante Virtual Sound Card, and it would be routed directly out. So that card um, is now picking off the preamp, no processing, no anything. So I, I don't want it to be a direct out, or I'd have to move the direct out pick point all the way front in line, so it's not getting anything. So it's just phantom power, gain it up, send it over the card into my reference software. It would use the USB card input as the driver, and that would be my reference channel. So my measurement channel, I would have to go back into Smart, use the output driver to look at the X32, and it would be a card input. So that would come in on channel 32. But I want it to go loop in and back, a loop out and back in to another channel. So that is channel 32. I would send directly to a aux out. So I go to routing, um, aux out, um, and I would do a direct out of channel 32. So that would then loop out, use a TRS cable uh, to XLR, come back into a channel, call it channel 30, and that is my loop back. And then this would then be routed to uh, the outputs. Uh, sorry, <laughs> get myself the card outputs. I can either use a user out if I want to make pass that all here so it can be a little bit more fine tuned. Uh, but that is where you would push it uh, to be able to send that now back into. Uh, smart as your reference signal. So make sure to include the loop out. And again, I like to not have as much of the <laughs> uh, the processing in line, but then it would be used that channel 32 input um, then to send pink noise uh, to the system. So I know that was kind of quick, but that's kind of, it's a weird subdivision of labor to be able to do that. All right, let's see. Uh, is it a matter to consider the range per box of subarrangement if we place it on the ground? I, I'm not sure if I understand your question. The range? Um, ask that a different way. I'll come back to you, I promise. So Thomas, for that arena, a little bit small numbers of subs. What about power valleys? So yeah, totally. Um, the KS-118s are really efficient. And again, this was a graduation show, so it's not like we needed a thunderous amount of subs, but the case 118s really blow me away. So that's four for the floor. And yes, I did have power alleys and valleys because they're left right. I wish I could have done a flown center sub, but there's like a gobo and a light thing, and just it just wasn't in the show scope. So you're right, it's not optimal, but I at least got rid of the rear rear wall rejections by going with the cardioid setup. Uh, but no, two four was plenty. Um, and even doing like an outdoor show I've done with six HDL 6 H per side and then three case 118s in the middle with the middle one reversed and it was plenty of gas. <laughs> so they're really efficient. Um, 
uh, you should definitely check out these subs. So, uh, so uh, I will say, just in case you weren't here, there is a flown center sub array that has, I think, 14 subs total for the bowl. So I'm only responsible for the floor with just those four subs. So I just want to be very clear with that. That's not four subs for the entire arena. So Matt, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Dave Hammer, do you gain match PA and fills with measurement mic or using your ears? I first do it with a measurement microphone. I put it in like in the middle, in the middle of their zones then get the high frequencies to match. And then I usually walk it. And then if something feels weird, I'm feel free to free, feel free. But I always verify, uh, get data first. So I have a very systematic approach. And then after I feel good about all my data, then verify it with my ears to see if that's lining up with how I want it to do. So usually after that, it's like a DB or two adjustments, nothing major. So yes, thanks. How reverse polarity and measurement mic could affect phase trace reading? Is it such a big problem? Uh, yeah, totally. <laughs> so you're kind of chasing your tail at that point if you have not made sure that you can trust the polarity on your microphone or your speaker. Um, and so I think being able to test your microphone and make sure it's right um, is, is good from the get-go. And how you can do that without having to get, get out a meter or whatever is just get multiple microphones and make sure they're all matching. I highly doubt that most a lot of microphones would be all <laughs> inverted polarity, um, but just check it against other microphones and see what you got. And it could also be the input on your interface or other any sort of thing. So just move systematically through your chain to see what you can get. So Aiken, just want to ask something different from a permitted just learned along. It will be necessary to place additional subwoofer behind. Let's say we have a gallery behind the hall. Uh, let's see. I'm I'm not I'm not quite sure what you mean to uh, play place it behind if we have a gallery behind the hall. So like if you do are you asking like a relay sub array? Clarify with me there. So thanks, Derek. Anyway, hi from Indonesia. I'm interested in just learning in this field lately. Really like your explanation on your channel. Thank you so much. Keep it up. No, thank you. Nick, which channel do you usually put the horrible screeching feedback? I usually like to have some on hand in case the client is rude. That's funny. Well, the funny thing is that one of the like third time I did this show, it was right when the pandemic hit. And so they had a, a 25 graduation ceremonies with only like a few students each and everyone was spread around the bowl. I'd have a clap track ready because every student got their diploma, walked out of the arena. So the poor last 10 students were the only 10 students and their parents in the arena. So they didn't feel alone. I had to like fade up this like applause track just to make them feel welcome. So that's what I had to do on this show. So uh, Michael with Precision Audio Services, if you're using the same mic for everything, it doesn't affect the alignment process at all. If you're using more than one mic, you want to make sure they match before you start. Oh, yes. Great clarification here. Yep. Because you... So yeah, I'm trying to think that from a polarity perspective. Yes, you at least get consistent data. So thank you for clarifying that, Michael. And smart, you can invert polarity on the input meters if it bothers you. Got it. Yeah. So yeah, as long as the data is consistent across everything, that totally makes sense. So thanks for the clarification here. Uh, Michael works for Rational Acoustics, so he's going to be the resident expert on that. Um, so Mark, I think he meant at the rear of the seating, relay likely. Okay. Um, yes. So, th and grateful, Mez, you got the clarification there. So Aiken, a floor subwoofer in addition to what you have in front. So yeah, so let's say if like I had like a really deep room, like a relay subwoofer, that that would be there. Uh, let's see. Uh, so this is a subarray that I did uh, in this room where I had to fly. Here's the main subarray for just this part of the floor. And there's this tunnel that went down here. And so this is a different gig. But you can see on the drawing here, I have the main room and then I have this segment. So I ended up doing a relay sub array. So yes, if a room is very deep, especially like in a very different acoustic space of like this very big open thing in this skinny tunnel, uh, I ended up adding a relay array. So the first one was four dual 18s and inline gradient uh, quad setup for the wide audience. And the drivers are very close to get a wide pattern, which you can see here. And then I spaced four single 18s and pulled them apart so I can narrow the pattern for that tunnel. And that's what they look like in the air. Uh, so yes, I have done relay subarrays, but for this audience, since it's really wide and not that deep, I didn't worry about it. I just wanted each of their subs to cover out in front of their zones. Again, flown subs would have been optimal. 
And here's what that looked right uh, looked like. I had the passive subarray right here covering this area. And then I had the active subarray, those four single 18s covering this array. Um, so Bayou, does the distance, I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name, does the distance of placing the sub box have an effect? Should it stack or side by side? Uh, so you can actually look up one of uh, Michael Lawrence's articles. He does a review of this sub um, and he can, uh, he actually, he gave me all the smart data too, uh, measuring it side by side versus having it stacked and you get more, um, you get better cancellation in the rear if it's stacked, uh, but you still get some if you put it side by side. I can't remember the efficiency of each. I think it was like 18 dB versus 12 dB. Michael can correct me if I'm wrong, but both work with the same cardioid setting. It just does a better job if they are stacked on top of one another. All right, here. I'll give a little bit more time for questions in the queue if we need it. This has been awesome, guys. I think, uh, and girls, we've been live a little bit over an hour. Again, this will be on YouTube. Uh, so Derek got Michael's book yesterday. It's a great read. Yeah. Okay. I promise I'll switch my camera back when we need it, but yeah, here it is. This is Michael's book. Definitely go get it. Uh, you can go to his website. Uh, I think precision audio services.com slash book. Uh, I think it's it, or just Google it, look on Amazon, whatever. It's fantastic. Definitely get it. Um, and then once you finish that, get this book. So <laughs> that's what you need to do. If you want to keep leveling up, very cool, folks. Um, absolutely, Michael. No, I'm happy to shout out stuff that's awesome and you're awesome. Again, if you haven't joined the Signal to Noise podcast Discord server, it's amazing. I ask questions in there all the time and learn from people way smarter than me. Um, it, it's really a place that's very comfortable to learn and ask stupid questions or just ask about random gear situations. I've found it really helpful. Uh, there are not jerks in there. So, so Nick says, just finished the, uh, Bob McCarthy's book a couple of days ago. Oh, just finished Michael's book a couple of today. Bob's is on the way. Wonderful. I think it's a great learning journey. Uh, you can check it out. Um, See, Bob's book is a bit more of a daunting. Yes, it is a daunting read. It's 577 pages in the, the third edition, but it's so worth it. You come back to it again and again. I love his jokes. Uh, I feel like he's, I've never met him, but I feel like he's my audio grandfather, if you will. Or he's like Audio Yoda, and then Michael Lawrence is Obi-Wan, I think, to, to everyone else. So um, he's been really, really, really helpful to me in my own journey. Um, so Jeff, Michael, just want to take a moment to thank you for your great content. Uh, you've given our church so many pointers. Thank you. Yes, happy to help. I'm, I'm so glad these streams have been helpful to you guys. And it's cool to now put something out in a formalized course format that's more uh, linear than just a bunch of random videos. Uh, so I will mention that one more time. My, my course is out and available. It's called the Making Sense of Sound, How Sound Actually Works in Live PA Systems. Um, I feel like the biggest takeaway for most people is really understanding phase a little bit more. And that was really daunting for me. So you can check that out. Here's the inside of the course. Uh, the basic package has this course, the, the advanced one. Uh, you actually get three bonus videos of me putting a GoPro on my head and tuning three different systems. So that's a lot of fun. So anyway, thank y'all so much for being here. I'll give you one last chance to ask questions and I will land the plane. I'll also remind you that I'm doing this again tomorrow and Thursday. <laughs> so tomorrow we're going to be talking about how big of a line array do you need? So if you're on a show, how many boxes, how do you figure that out? Um, and then on Thursday, I'm going to talk about how in this same room, the very first time I did this gig with a different PA, how I screwed up the rig royally. <laughs> so that's going to be fun to talk through that failure and what I learned from it that led me to make a better deployment with this rig from RCF. So anyway, pretty, pretty stoked about that. Uh, again, feel free to comment on the live stream afterwards. If you have any additional questions, stay tuned for more stuff, catch the course. Uh, again, thank you for everyone taking time to be here. I know for some of you, it's 2 a.m. for some of you out here. So thanks for sticking with me. Uh, this is Michael Curtis. Thank you so much uh, for your time and attention. And I will catch you tomorrow at 12 p.m. Central Standard Time. That is noon. That is one o'clock Eastern and whatever else, somewhere else. So anyway, thanks for being here. Um, appreciate it. See y'all on the flippity flip.